on today's video, we see some felons driving some whips. Hi friends, welcome to today's bonus badge cam lesson here at Active Self Protection. I'm your host, John Correa. I'm your co-host, Mike Williver, and today's video comes once again from that fount of content for Active Self Protection, Houston, Texas. Today's video is sponsored by Backstreet Surveillance, Active Self Protection's trusted source for home and business surveillance. They offer free expert system design and quotes using their Backstreet Surveillance system design tool to help you build the perfect system for your application. They also offer nationwide professional installation, remote smartphone monitoring, and their revolutionary 364K camera to help you keep track of and protect that which you love. Check them out at the link in the description and thank them for bringing us today's video. Houston PD is initiating a traffic stop on a truck that is speeding pretty significantly. Uh, officers roll up pretty well and you're gonna see them ask him to roll the windows down so that they can see through the windows. He's gonna run off instead. So they're gonna chase him. If you go watch the original, it's about a 15 minute total chase here, but he's gonna decide that he wants to ram their patrol cruiser twice. Here's the first one with sound. Oh, no, he's gonna hit us. He just rear it, backed into us, rammed, rammed us. Agasol is now Agasol. After that, he's gonna take off again. You can go watch on the original that Houston PD let loose that there's dash cam of, of him doing it a second time. These guys, because of traffic, are gonna bail out of the truck right now. Let's listen into what happens. On 45. I'm good. Give me cuffs. Right here. Oh, got one. Get that arm back. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up. Blood, 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 blood. That's fine with the blood. Give me that arm. You go sit down somewhere. Hey, stay. I got the gun. Leave it where it's at right now. Hey, let's do Where's the gun? It's right here. I got it. Hey, whoever shot, go to your car. I'm good. I'm good. Here's the dash cam of them bailing out of the truck. You can see it's actually three of them. Two passengers run off. The driver runs off. And you see our officer there is going to fill that guy in. This guy actually lived. And you can see the secondary officer show up here. They get the other two passengers into custody as well. You can see the gun right there at his feet on the right hand side as they come up and arrest him. And, and now you got a picture of the firearm here as well. So the, uh, the, the news story says that this guy actually lived through this. He is now facing four felony charges. Thankfully, no one else was injured in this one. All right, we know the lessons coming out of this one, right? If you're a felon in possession of a firearm, um, obey traffic laws. Or just don't be a felon in possession. Oh, firearm. that's an option. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, Mike, how fast a simple traffic stop for speeding turns into a high-speed pursuit, aggravated assault, and an officer-involved shooting. Uh, absolutely nuts, dude. You know, this is one of those things you, you don't see coming to the beginning of your shift. You might, you might think, oh, we might get into a pursuit tonight. That's always a possibility. It is Houston, after all. Um, but the, the, idea that, the idea that someone is going to stop in the middle of a pursuit and ram your vehicle with the back of their vehicle, and a big vehicle too, big old F-150, um, is not something that happens usually in anyone's career. Just like most cops never fire their gun in the line of duty, uh, most cops don't get rammed. We've seen a few here in the recent past on this channel of cops getting rammed with other vehicles. Um, maybe it's becoming a trend. I certainly hope not. And, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in, you know, in the midst of this chaotic situation. You got to understand, folks. You, you jump out at the end of a pursuit, you, your adrenaline doesn't get much higher than that. Your blood pressure doesn't get much higher than that uh, and within a safe range. You're, you're now in a chaotic environment. You, you've got to start looking around. Who's around here? Are there bystanders? Am I going to get hit by a car? There's all the noise of the, the sirens still going. It's a lot. So to focus your thoughts and pay attention to what you're doing, put all those factors together and get up to this guy 
and do what you have to do to make your community safe, it's a lot, it's a big cognitive load, but I think he handled it really well. I think he did. And, and one of the things that you notice here is you can see his right hand on camera right now. He doesn't have a gun in his hand at this point because we have a foot pursuit of fleeing suspects after a traffic stop, right? Even after really committed aggravated assault by backing the car into him, okay, cool. It's not until he gets the gun and is threatening another car with it that he then starts filling him in. So he's shooting at a running target here, himself running even at fairly close range. I will say this as well. We can see on his dash cam here, Mike, that the guy drops his pistol after getting shot, I think the first or second time. So several shots, I think he got him at least once. So the guy drops the pistol. And I know people are gonna complain a little bit, like, man, that was a lot of shots, especially when the guy's already on the ground. But remember, the officer's got the gun up and in his line of sight, and he's trained to see his front sight if he's not using a pistol-mounted optic, and so he's not going to see what's going on with the guy's hands at that point. He is using the, the training that he has been given. It's actually an argument, in my opinion, for transitioning officers to a pistol-mounted optic because you can see around the gun a whole lot better. Yeah, we talk a lot, John, about why we don't, as officers, we don't want to be aimed in on someone's center of mass um, unnecessarily. You know, if we're, if we're taking down a felony suspect and he, his hands appear to, or her hands appear to be empty, uh, we want to keep, if we have our gun drawn to protect ourselves, we want to keep that down and out of the line of sight so we can see what the hands are doing. That doesn't apply here. He's already, this guy's already presented a deadly threat, so this officer needs to be up and on target. Let's talk about shooting people in the back. We've talked about this a bunch of times before, but it bears repeating. It's not where you shoot, it's why you shoot. Why was he shooting? Because this person was aiming a, a, a gun at his partner. And about not seeing the gun fall out of his hands or be dropped or whatever, you know, when you, when you stop that video and I get a good look at what's falling, it, you, sure, is this a 480p camera? Yeah, it is, but it doesn't look like a gun to me. I don't, I'm not, I don't associate white with firearms, generally speaking. Um, certainly not privately owned firearms, like a pearl handle or whatever that was. Uh, if he was able to see it at all, would he be able to perceive that was the gun he was holding? I don't think so. It's more likely cocaine or meth or something he's, he's dumping to get rid of it, so he hopes he won't get charged with that extra charge. So I think all the way around, this was not only justified, but despite the fact that it looks a little weird that he's shooting him in the back and everything else, as I said earlier, under these circumstances, we're in the middle of a freeway on-ramp right now, you know? Uh, we've just been in a, in a lengthy pursuit. I think this officer took this cognitive, um, extremely big cognitive load and handled it and did what he had to do in this situation. And it, I guarantee it was not easy. Yeah, and human reaction times being what they are, right? So now, listen, he can say, oh, stop shooting. Now it's time to stop shooting and still fire up to three rounds when he's firing at the about quarter second splits that he's doing that. And so, you know, he might have said, whoa, Nelly, but then to get the brain to tell the trigger finger to stop can take up to a, a half second after that, which you can fire three rounds in that much time. So, so listen, at some point you got to stop. And he did here. As soon as I think he sees the guy's hand and he doesn't have a gun anymore and he's down, he stops shooting. But that can take a little bit. Now, let's talk a little bit about when the officer chooses to draw and to fire here. I think it's kind of interesting because watch our suspect here. You can see him kind of in the middle of the screen and he's got the gun in his right hand. You can see that hand kind of winging around to his right when he's running away from it. But then what you're going to see is as I've slowed it down, you're going to see him, he's looking right and then left and then right. And when he looks back left, his hand is going to come back around to the, to the left with him and point the gun at another officer. So that's when he does that, points it at the cop car that's coming up. And that on the right is when our officer chooses to draw his firearm. I'm going to tell you, the first time I read the, the kind of news investigation that the officer said, oh, it's when he pointed a gun at another cruiser that I chose to draw my firearm and shoot this guy. I was like, man, I didn't see it. It took me really slowing down the dash cam to see that on video as well. And, and I do think that's why careful video analysis is an important part of, of looking over justification for shootings. But also, he was right. That was exactly what he did see, and sometimes the camera's not gonna catch that. Yeah, it's one of those things, John. The, the badge cams and dash cams, we, we do our best to get, get you know to have these sort of stable videos that we can use as evidence later on because this is in fact evidence that's why we have the cameras and, and the audio video recording I, you know you're much better at this sort of thing than i am when it comes to breaking down the video and i i don't know that i would have seen that even you know I, I barely see it now because you're pointing it out but yeah you can see as the officer if you look at the officer on the right hand side not the far right the one the one who ended up shooting you can see he's just now drawing he hasn't fired yet he hasn't done anything yet 
He's just now drawing his gun when he perceives this threat to his fellow officers. So I think uh, well spotted by you. Well, I mean, you know, this is kind of what I do for a living. And when I get called to ex expert witness testimony, this is what they're hiring me for, right? So uh, grateful for those things. But, but again, I think completely justified conduct in that moment for that. I also just want to say, what a crazy thing, Mike, to turn. And, and, and I don't see anything in this guy's history. It's not like he was a, a felon in possession or anything like that. But, but let's just, for all of us private citizens, okay, um, the officer was not ready to shoot him for the aggravated assault of the, um, you know, of hitting them with the patrol cruiser. It was when he pointed a gun as he's running away from the cops at another cruiser. So if you don't want to get shot by the cops, one of the best ways to do that is don't point a gun at him. And, and listen, that seems like kind of self-evident advice, but apparently it's, we need to go back to, you know, gentlemen, this is a football and go, hey, let's not do this. Let's do better. So, so totally justified conduct by the officer here. I think what a crazy situation to be in. Good marksmanship. I get why he shot him in the back. I got no problems with that. I even get why he shot him so many times because again, human performance is what it is, especially under stressful environments. Hey, friends and family, let's teach our kids, our neighbors, our communities um, not to run away from the cops with guns in our hands and do better at covering our ass.